Hello and welcome to From the Research Chair. This is episode two. I am Jason Voss and my partner in crime, Michael Falk, will be joining us here shortly. Today's subject is curiosity. Uh, it's something that both Michael and I refer to as an investment superpower. And we're going to be discussing some of why we believe that. Um, we're going to be discussing a good definition of curiosity. And both of us have slightly differing opinions on that, that they, they contrast and compare with uh, dictionary definitions, which uh, we find wanting. And not only that, we're going to be discussing some of the neuroscience of creativity, or sorry, of curiosity. And we're going to discuss some of the limited research that's been done that demonstrates uh, curiosity's benefits, not just professionally, but in terms of your overall mental and physical well-being. And then we're going to conclude with uh, techniques and things that are scientifically demonstrated as well as battle tested because we've used them as investment professionals uh, that we know help to enhance curiosity. And of course, this features in some of our consulting work that we do at Focus Consulting, uh, where we engage with folks and uh, are able to uh, confirm that this uh, uh, is proven to enhance curiosity. So um, I'm going to begin uh, by discussing um, why curiosity is important to investment pros. Um, I think it's critically important because really, if you're going to perform better than everybody else is performing, that is, if you're doing something that no one else is doing, it requires that you explore territory and spaces that nobody else is exploring. And curiosity is that very motive force that takes us from where we are right now, our comfort zone, if you will, and is the, com the compelling need to exit that comfort zone. And so I would argue, just based on logic and principle, those who are more willing to explore new boundaries and to constantly push out the frontiers of what they know and what they believe are going to discover more things. And then they can bring to bear their full mental capabilities, their intelligence, their wisdom, and so on and so forth, and begin to evaluate um, those, what they've discovered. And that, of course, becomes the raw stuffs for investment decision making. So that's, I think, why investing uh, or curiosity, rather, is an investing superpower. I bet Michael would agree with me. Um, let's talk about a def dictionary definition of curiosity. Um, and this one comes from just a general uh, Google search that I did. You can hit define colon uh, curiosity, and it comes back as a strong desire to know or learn something. Um, that clearly is true. However, I think there's much more to it. And I think in the much more to it, there's interesting information that is informative uh, for and suggestive of what you can do in order to improve your curiosity. In particular, um, I tend to think of curiosity as a combination of several skills. Um, yes, there is that willingness to explore, that strong desire that the dictionary definition refers to. However, that requires a certain level of self-awareness or what scientists, neuroscientists and psychologists alike like to call metacognition. That's awareness of awareness itself. And to explore your boundaries, ergo, you have to know where your boundaries currently are. You have to know the knowledge limitations that you're currently confronted with and uh, after that, once you recognize that, you then have to have the confidence and courage to begin to cross that boundary. Oftentimes those intellectual, those, uh, those um, knowledge boundaries are there because of certain anxieties about our beliefs or the things we believe we know, which may in fact not be true. They may just be convenient mental models that have worked for us in the past, but not, don't necessarily uh, work in every situation. In other words, there might be something else out there. And so consequently, um, you, in addition to the self-awareness to know where you are and what you know and what you don't know, you have to have the confidence and courage to be able to cross that boundary. Said another way, you have to be okay with the idea that you might be ignorant or that you might not be fully capable in what you are doing. For us investment pros, where we are paid for our intellectual firepower, that can be an especially difficult thing. So I think curiosity requires that self-awareness, the confidence, and the courage. But I also think, and I, I would love to um, get Michael's opinion on this. He's not yet joined yet. Um, but there's a certain innocence about those who are curious. Um, and that innocence is that wide-eyed thing that we so admire in children, where they constantly ask why. And Interestingly, I just said, you know, you have to be willing to acknowledge your ignorance. Children don't understand that they're ignorant, which is why they're constantly asking why. 
And one of the pieces of scientific research uh, that I read as background for our conversation, as well as for my consulting work, shows that as the number of years of schooling you have increases, the number of questions you ask each day declines. By the time you graduate from college, uh, there, it's frequently the case that uh, most of us ask no questions at all in the course of a day regarding our knowledge. And in fact, it, the average for college age students is less than one question per day, meaning that it's, you know, approaching zero. So that innocence and how to restore that innocence is key. And I would argue also that confidence and courage feeds back into that innocence loop. If we're more courageous, if we're more confident of our, our intellectual capabilities, or for whatever reason, we're just comfortable uh, charting the unknown, it means we're going to start to ask more questions. We're not afraid of the failure that may lay on that other side. Um, so on curiosity, it's also how we get a breadth of knowledge. Many of us in the investment space have a tremendous depth of knowledge. In fact, many of us have spent decades uh, equipping our uh, minds with all kinds of deep knowledge that could be in valuation, it could be in security screening, it could be in how to talk to customers or clients if we're on the private wealth side or if we're in the distribution side, um, we may have a depth of knowledge um, about where the money lies um, that we can, you know, and, and the contacts lie that we can begin embracing and having, you know, conversations with in order to prospect. Um, but the breadth of knowledge comes because of our curiosity. It's the curiosity that allows us to explore those boundaries and those frontiers. And the breadth of knowledge turns out to be critically important for another key investment skill, and that's creativity. Creativity is doing what nobody else is doing very, very lockstep definition, right? Like this or hand in glove uh, with curiosity is creativity, doing what nobody else is doing. And that breadth of knowledge is key because science has demonstrated that one form of creativity, a very powerful form of creativity is permutations. That is connecting or interconnecting disparate pieces of knowledge together to come up with a new synthesis and a new idea. So for example, very simple example, and it may seem too simple, um, if we use the concept of PEs or multiples uh, in equity valuation, that same concept can be borrowed and used in real estate. And so we have cap rates, for example, in real estate. So that's a borrowed concept from equity valuation that's also been used to help uh, real estate. So I would argue it's because of somebody's curiosity who was in the real estate space, they probably also understood with their breadth of knowledge uh, through their curiosity what PE multiples were or price to sales multiples or whatever, and they borrowed the concept. Um, and I already said it in passing, but I want to explicitly state it here. If you compare the definition of curiosity and creativity, because again, I think they're very similar concepts, uh, you'll see that it's very similar to alpha. And those of you, and I see there are many of you today on the call who have known about my works for a long time, you've heard me say this before. Creativity and alpha are basically the same thing. Alpha is doing what nobody else is doing, uh, and creativity is essentially the same concept. So now I'm going to transition and switch to the science of curiosity. And admittedly, there are literally tens of thousands of neuroscience studies out there. There just isn't that much research on curiosity. It has escaped the notice and purview of most of the neuroscientific community. I don't know if that will change, but the research that is excuse me, is there, is in fact encouraging. And I'm going to quote these, not in chronological order, but just in sort of gee whiz, I think it's interesting order. The first study I want to talk to you about was done in 2002, and it was published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. And it found that children who show higher curiosity, and they have various uh, psychographic means of measuring uh, individuals' curiosity levels, that children who show more curiosity uh, have 11 points higher on IQ tests which doesn't sound like a lot, but remember IQ tests, by definition, they force the mean to be 100. So 11 points higher mean is a significant difference. It's essentially 11% more than average uh, on that. And that, that's a very, very, very hard job to do. So for example, an IQ of 130, by definition, is at the third standard deviation. So we're saying that curiosity moves people's IQ one standard deviation more toward a higher IQ. So that's a significant result. A 2000 study, um, which was published in Human Resource Development Quarterly, found that more curious employees have higher job performance than those less curious. Not only in terms of revenue per employee or sales, they looked at many different industries, they found that the productivity of those employees is much higher, the results of those employer, employers is, uh, employees rather is much higher. Um, now, 
I want to take a break here um, and point out that the following studies, the ones that I'm about to quote are at the individual level. Those first two, I think, are super compelling, especially for what we do in investment management. What's about to fall is more at the individual level. It's about the personal individual health level. Nonetheless, I think interesting about curiosity. So um, there was a 2011 study published in the journal Personality, which found that someone's trait curiosity, and again, measured by those psychographic uh, results, and by the way, if you're curious about curiosity and how to measure it, uh, I have uh, one of those psychographic tests at my disposal. And if you're interested, please email me, jvoss at focuscgroup.com, and I'm happy to send that uh, curiosity exam to you. Um, anyway, this study in 2011 uh, showed that someone's trait curiosity leads to new acquaintances feeling more connected to that person. Now, I don't know about you, but our business, uh, like it or not, revolves around relationships. So on the research team, um, our relationship to our fellow analysts or to our PM or to our chief investment officer or to our direct reports or with the distribution group or whomever, the relationship quality is extremely important, especially true on the front lines of the sales staff. So again, curiosity, those who are more curious tend to have deeper personal relationships with others. Hold on, Michael has joined. I'm going to make him a co-host. Michael, welcome. I am in the middle of discussing the neuroscience of creativity. I'm going to pause in demonstrating that you and I are very flexible, like we are in our consulting engagements. I've <laughs> talked about why I think curiosity is important. I've also talked about uh, a little bit of a definition of curiosity. The floor is yours, sir. Talk to us about why you said, and these are your words, curiosity is an investment superpower. Hit it. Well, well let me begin by making an example of curiosity. And for me personally today, you know what an example of curiosity is? What time zone do I live in? To get onto the podcast at the right time. Anyway, let's move past this. Jason has been giving you some just nuggets of gold on the neuroscience. So it's time for me to come in and dumb this down for the rest of us. Chunk it All down. Right? Chuck it up. <laughs> Listen, curiosity at its most base is learning. And if you think about the, the words used all over now about the importance of lifelong learning to all of us as the world changes, can we just say that in general life means learning? Can we say in general that curiosity in life is about expansion? Uh, we're, listen, we're not going to get into, but we could, but we're not going to get into that. Listen, you know why I think curiosity is a superpower? Because it is a defense against defensiveness. No matter what someone says to you, no matter what you experience, why did that happen? Why did they say that? Huh, what is that about? Curiosity let me repeat that, is a defense against defensiveness. You know how that works in the investment world? Oh my. I'm going to give you, number one, think of collaboration. If only collaboration. If you don't get triggered defensively, how much better can you collaborate? Number one. I speak of, and Jason speaks of, when we work with investment teams, there are seven pieces to the puzzle. Research, I'm sorry, idea generation, research, vetting, buying, sizing, selling. I'm using one hand, that's six, and learning is seven. All right, well, let's think about how curiosity connects. Idea generation, yes. Research, yes. The vetting of the idea with a team of hopefully cognitively different people, yes. Selling, oh yeah, why is this stock going down that I own? Is my thesis broken? Maybe your thesis wasn't right in the first place. Can you get curious about that? And postmortems. Curiosity is represented in essentially six out of the seven pieces of the investment process puzzle. If we can't see that as a superpower, I don't know what is. So I'm going to pause there, Jason.
Well, Michael, you'll be thrilled, of course, uh, because the next several studies I'm going to quote uh, for purposes of our audience enforce exactly what you've just said. Um, so, for example, in 1996, there's an American Psychological Association study that found that curiosity keeps the mind young. And the way they measured, measured this is they looked at people who were seniors and they measured their trait curiosity in year one. And then five years later, um, they checked in on several things. One was, are they still alive? And those who were curious actually stayed alive longer, which is super interesting if you ask me. In addition, um, they had a much lower cognitive decline, which uh, is, is again proving that curiosity is a superpower because it can actually seemingly lengthen your life. Um, let's talk about the neuroscience and the, co the um, neural correlates of curiosity. And I don't know if you've ever looked at these studies before, but they tend to be very, very complicated, right? And sometimes there will be multiple brain regions. Um, of the 130 plus brain regions, you sometimes see up to 60 that are triggered by individual neural correlates, things like intuition, for example, one of my pet subjects. Uh, but with curiosity, it's not much, and it reinforces what Michael has just said. Um, in particular, there are two regions. The caudate region of the mind is uh, triggered. Caudate is associated with reward anticipation. And at the top, I said that um, innocence is seemingly a part of curiosity. Those who are more innocent tend to ask more questions. Um, they also, if you think about children, when they ask the questions, they're so thrilled. And when their question is answered, that's exactly how they experience it, is that there's a reward associated with exploring just past their comfort zone and their boundaries. The second region of the brain that is triggered uh, is called the parahippocampal gyrus, as well as the left inferior frontal gyrus. So the gyrus region is- There will be a what? spelling test at the end of this podcast. I just want everybody <laughs> to know. Well, I, I'm proud to say parahippocampal does not, uh, it triggers all of Microsoft Word spell check. So it's not <laughs> recognized. But those two brain regions, both part of the gyrus, they're subregions of the gyrus region, are associated with learning. So exactly what you said, Michael. Uh, curiosity is scientifically demonstrated to trigger the learning regions of the brain. Last bit on th this particular study, that same research uh, that looked at the neural correlates also looked to test uh, th those findings in terms of is there reward anticipation and when they tested it and yes they found that that was the case it was predictive of those regions being triggered they had a, 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 um, an example test of answering trivia questions they also found that people's memories for the things they were curious about were much better formed and much easier to recall at a later moment in time now we're going to pause. I've got my first poll question today for the group. And for those of you who joined us the first time, uh, the polling was a little bit focacta, as my wife would say, <laughs> in that all the questions were stacked on top. It was the first time I had used the polling feature. I think today it's going to be a little bit better. And so here's our first polling question. I would rate my own curiosity as very high, high, moderately high, moderately low, low, very low. And I'll pause. Almost everyone has voted. I think, Michael, you get to vote, if I'm not mistaken. No, 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 I'm not going to bias the vote. All right. Uh, the results are very high, 38%, high, 31%, moderately high, 23%, moderately low, 8%, low zero, and very low zero. May, may I comment on that result? Of course, please. The one person who selected moderately low, thank you for your candor and your honesty. I don't know if it's true. But for the rest of you, are you all sailing on Lake Wobegon right now? How do you know that your curiosity is high? Which is going to take us to another question. Dun, dun, dun. And folks, we have to have a little fun with this, so. Oh, well, now that's interesting. It's only allowing me to put the original poll up there. Looks like we're fasting out more focaccia. Ah, ah, oh, that's devastating. We actually had a question to, to try and help you measure your curiosity to see if it fit maybe with your prior vote. Now, listen, the fact that you're on this podcast with us, you have to be at least moderately high curi uh, curious, right? Because let's be candid. Why else would you be on this podcast? So give your all, give all of you, give yourself a gold star and let's move on.
And I, I beg forgiveness from all of you. I've altered my background. The camera that I'm using today is not my best camera. Don't ask why. You could be curious as to why. And uh, I didn't want to be as ghostly as I was on our new form background. So please excuse. Well, when we say new, we don't necessarily mean final. And that was one of our polling questions. Um, it was. We're transitioning now. And Michael, please take the, the top of this conversation. How to improve curiosity. Hopefully, we've made a case both logically as well as supported with the limited amount of scientific research that's been done on the subject, that curiosity is important. Now we're gonna talk about how to improve curiosity. This is based in some cases on scientific research, which will probably be more what I talk about, as well as our anecdotal work with uh, consulting clients. Michael. Yeah, you know, let's not make this too complicated is, is my point. And when I think about how to stoke curiosity, the first thought that comes into my mind is just expand. Let me explain. You've heard of generalists and specialists. You have heard of experts. And when you have a specialist or an expert, that's defined by people diving deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into whatever topic they are diving into. The first step for curiosity is not necessarily to go deeper, that's okay, but to go wider. How many different things? Are you reading a newspaper, uh, Jason will get into this for himself, are you reading USA Today in the US? Are you reading the Financial Times in the UK? Are you reading a, a newspaper from India? Are you reading a newspaper from Japan? That's if you speak Japanese or a translation. Listen, what I'm getting at is the breadth of information that you're looking into. Are you multidisciplinary or to what extent? So curiosity can be depth and it can be breadth. What you please consider, I'm not gonna say you need to know this, but please consider the future is going to favor generalists over specialists for two potential reasons. Number one, the future is about change. When you're a generalist, you can adapt more easily. I think people understand this. When you're a specialist, you may be in high, high demand. However, that specialty has the greatest amount of existential risk. Maybe that specialty won't be necessary in the future. So how do you start stoking curiosity? Read different stuff listen to different stuff and start to explore what you like about it, what you don't like about it, base level, what you understand about it, what you don't understand about it, next level, where you wanna go deeper, where you're gonna leave it alone. So that's my entree, Jason. Well, you know what? I have been able to figure out how to launch the second question, which is exactly in accord with what you've just said. So I'm gonna launch question two here. And it's, I pursue information from reading in X number of topic areas or sources weekly, which is exploring some of this breadth that Michael was talking about. And when, when this question is reading X number of topic area sources, we're thinking about breath generally. 10 of you or 83% of you have voted so far. Waiting for two who have not. Well, I'm gonna call it right there. I'm gonna end that. I'm gonna share the results. And you can see the outcome right there. Half of you greater than 10. And that's super interesting. Michael, do you have more to say on cultivating curiosity? Well, I think this is an initial step. Start to read stuff that is foreign to you. And I don't mean foreign language. <laughs> I mean foreign to you. You know, let me give you an example. The diversity of the stuff that I read. It might be baseball statistics. Yes, I'm a bit of a baseball geek. It might be neuroscience. It might be more behavioral or pure psychology. 
It might be economics, it might be social policy, it might be investment theory. I am naturally curious. It's, it's a personality flaw. I, I, I'm joking. Uh, it's part of who I am. And for a lot of people in the investment business, it's also part of who they are in some way, shape or form. For the half of you that are, well, the predominant number of you that are greater than or equal to 10 different sources, you're, you're, you're on the spectrum, my friends, of being curious. For the one person who is greater than or equal to five, you still might be. I cannot know from that answer that you're not. But I think this is an extraordinary result, Jason. Uh, three people, eight, eight people are 10 or more. Nine people are 10 or more. This is really strong. I agree. And I, I have met, and I bet you have met, and I bet our audience has met people in the investment business who are reliant on one source of information or just two sources. And one of the benefits, I think, and one of my top secret weapons as a fund manager was, and I still engage in the same routine every single day and have for now over 25 years, I start at 8 a.m. and from 8 a.m. until 10, 10 a.m., I read as many different news sources as I can, and I read on average around 60 each day. And one of the benefits, we're talking about curiosity and creating a breadth of knowledge, but one of the other benefits, and I'll just mention it because it's also a, a, a highly beneficial thing about that kind of reading, is that you get the same story from multiple perspectives. And that's key to ensuring that what you're reading is free of editorial bias. So for example, the New York Times might report something one way, whereas the China Daily might report the same story in an entirely different way, given the priorities that are present in China and as put forth by that editor. Um, Michael, I'm gonna hit some of the um, scientifically demonstrated stuff that uh, can improve curiosity, as well as discuss some of my own experience with the, with the subject. Um, the first, and this is an anecdotal thing, is reward questions, not just answers. Um, very frequently, Michael and I find that in meetings, as we observe them as part of our embedding work in particular, uh, the whole me meaning of the meeting is directed at finding answers to presumably the most important question. And very little reward or time is spent honoring questions and surfacing new questions about the same information. So for example, if it's the morning pitch meeting at a sell side firm, you would hope that a lot of questions are asked and who and ideally can't be answered because it means that question is just past the frontiers of knowledge of the collective group to be able to answer unless it sparks a new uh, level of research. So that's the first thing is to reward questions. Can I, uh, can I give you an interesting quote about that very topic? Of course. I'm gonna paraphrase because I'm not gonna nail it perfectly. Pablo Picasso once said, computers are useless. They don't know how to ask questions. Um, that, it's not the exact quote, but you can search it. Uh, Pablo Picasso. What's interesting about this, folks, is that we talk about the threat or the tool of AI coming into the investment world. Will it displace all the humans? Can't. Computers don't know how to ask questions. Totally agree. Um, next bit, and this, this one comes from some of the work that I've done with teams over the years in lots of different ways. So Michael and I frequently engage on strategy. Um, I, in particular, am in favor of scenario planning, which very few organizations engage in. But a part of the scenario planning work that I do is to ask people to take their own mental inventory of what they know exceptionally well and literally write down the skills that they have and then the next thing they do is secondary skills where they have some passing knowledge. Uh, they're not quite expert, but nonetheless good. And to begin to chart this, why is that important? We said at the top of this uh, podcast that curiosity was about a familiarity with your boundaries and then a willingness to cross them to explore new things. Well, if you don't know what your boundaries are, 
um, then there's no way possibly to be able to cross them. And I found that this exercise very frequently triggers a knowing in people about things that are on their near periphery, which they may find of some use. It also sometimes, and this is perhaps the more useful uh, benefit for this exercise, it will trigger a memory of something where they, in their passing of their, their work lives, thought to themselves, hey, I wish I knew more about that. And by doing the mental inventory, you can begin to record these things and you can begin to go explore those things. Ergo, you can expand your, not, your knowledge boundary. You can honor your curiosity. And this is exactly the next tip. And this one comes from my book, The Intuitive Investor, which is to be guided by your ignorance. When I said earlier that I read over 60 news sources each day, I read that news in a very special way. I don't ever read news stories about things I already know about. I read headlines about things I know about because I read all of the headlines, but usually the headline is the story. It's usually the thing that just barely advances my knowledge and tells me how knowledge point A has advanced uh, via the news over the last 24 hour news cycle. Instead, I'm guided by my ignorance. As I encounter a headline and I don't understand what it is, I always open that story and read until I understand. If I don't understand the topic that I'm reading that the headline indicated, I will then go to the web and try and search out information on that subject. If that doesn't answer my question, I will frequently search out a scientific paper or I'll even sometimes read a book on the subject, depending on what I think the possible worth of that would be. Seven now, it's important at this point to pause for a moment. Yeah. Because Jason has just represented his level of curiosity to all of you that are listening. I, I will, Jason's, Jason's level of curiosity, folks, is up here, right? You can strive for this. You might be there. You can embrace it. You can pursue it. You can be down here and still be really, really good at this. I just want you to understand, Jason is so skilled in this area and his methods, listen to his methods because they matter. Very kind of you to say. Um, I, I wish I could claim like I had had some epiphany when I came by this technology, be, being guided by your ignorance, but it was born of being overwhelmed during earnings season, and aren't we all, and being in, un, incapable uh, wholly of digesting all of the news about all of my portfolio in a given day during earnings season. And so I got in the habit of just skimming the headlines and only reading the stuff that I didn't know because I, my assumption then was that's where the greatest danger lies. And what I noticed is that my fluency with my portfolio and in understanding the world started rising a lot based on that habit. And so I formalized it and I'm almost always guided by my ignorance. You know, let's take a pause and talk about for, that for just a quick moment. Do it, do All it. of us know about the existence of behavioral biases and the litany of new ones that seem to be printed every day in the academia. All right, enough. We're human. We're not irrational. We're suboptimal, if you prefer. No, you're human. We all make mistakes. Biases exist for a very good reason is because our brain sucks up so much energy from our body. 20% of our metabolic resource is at rest, which means that our brain is constantly trying to economize. It's a Prius, if you will, the car, all right, electric car. Our brain's trying to save energy. So our brain is not trying to embrace our ignorance. Our brain is trying to embrace what we already know. Confirmation bias overconfidence. You can see where this is going, right? So you have to kind of flip it and think, I'm going to embrace my ignorance. I'm going to do this purposefully. So to do this purposefully, you have to have the energy to do this. Time of day, Jason talked about when he did it. You probably want to have a snack before you pursue this. I'm not kidding. There is all sorts of interesting research. I'm giving you the translation about the importance to, to embrace your ignorance is something your brain does not like. So you have to kind of train yourself, sit, make sure you're not hungry, make sure you're rested to do this. Totally agree. And uh, Michael, it's funny, I, I've only became a breakfast eater because it's never been my favorite meal until I became a research analyst. And then I would be exhausted at 10 a.m. as I completed what I just described. And so I got in the habit of 
uh, load, carb loading at like 7.30. Um, so you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. Um, the next thing I want to highlight, uh, which there is lots of scientific evidence for, um, in terms of increasing uh, your open-mindedness and reducing your bias, and that is to practice things that increase your self-awareness. Remember at the top of our conversation today, I said that you have to have awareness of your boundaries and a willingness and courage to sort of go exploring. And so you need to have some sort of self-awareness practice. I mentioned the mental inventory before, but those of you who have followed my writings for a long time, and I see several of you in the audience, know that I'm a long, lifelong advocate for meditation, which is like rocket fuel for increasing your self-awareness. But there are other ways of doing it. For example, we're having a conversation today, Michael and I, and we're learning about one another. We're amplifying one another. So said another way, talk to other people, surface some of those thoughts that you have and be, be willing and courageous to look potentially foolish to that other person by expressing some of what you don't know. And I have a habit of, for example, when I go to the grocery store, striking up a conversation with the checkout clerk. This is pre-COVID, obviously, because now they don't want you opening your mouth at the checkout line. But I would very frequently learn something interesting and new that I hadn't because somebody would mention what was top of mind for them. And that was a new subject matter to me. I, I did this on airplanes. I do this when I'm standing in line. Strike up a conversation with somebody who is right next to you. Absolutely. Remember the science I quoted earlier that showed that more curious people have deeper connections as reported by the person who wasn't measured on their curiosity. In other words, as measured by the, the control or the test subject on the other side, they report having a deeper connection with those who were curious. Why? Because there are lots of questions asked in pursuit of what that person knows and people interpret that as connection. Um, questions, so questions, questions, questions. I have two thoughts on questions. Number one, do you know when you're defensive? Remember I said curiosity is a defense against defensiveness. Do you know that when you ask a question, it forces you to be open and curious and not closed and defensive? Ooh, now there's a little trick. Uh, the other thing about questions I wanted to mention is you can ask them. Put them in the chat box. Let's hear what you are curious about. I'm thoroughly loving this dialogue with Jason, but that doesn't mean you can't join in. A absolutely. Feel free to ask questions. I'm almost done in terms of tips for improving curiosity. Uh, the next one, and this is a practice much more than uh, anything that's supported by science. If you feel anxiety, and this requires self-awareness to know when you feel anxious and you are encountering something new, I have a rule of thumb. and It's one of my life's mottos. If something scares you, then you have to try it. And obviously within reason, it scares me to jump <laughs> off of a cliff without a parachute. Um, but I'm nonetheless cognizant of the fact when I encounter something that's new and I feel anxious, I know that I've reached my boundary, something that uh, I've reached my comfort zone. And on the other side of my comfort zone lies more knowledge and more self-awareness about what's possible. Um, the next thing is honor curiosity for curiosity's sake. In other words, there may not be an immediate payoff. Our culture is obsessed with and our industry is obsessed with the concerns of the MBA, right? What's the return on investment? Well, oftentimes the return on investment may not be felt for many years into the future, and we may not even know or be able to recognize how curiosity provided the raw stuffs of a great solution because we've long since forgotten it and we became fluent with the knowledge acquired by honoring our curiosity perhaps years prior. But just trust me on this one. You have to honor curiosity for curiosity's sake. And then the Next thing I'm gonna bring up is psychological safety is scientifically de demonstrated to increase the level of curiosity as well as questioning uh, within workforce. So if you are a supervisor or if you're a team member, always encourage or support uh, the psychological safety of your team. And there are lots of other benefits beyond curiosity. Um, creativity is another realm that benefits tremendously from psychological safety. Um, but anyway, that, that's a key one. The last point on this, and then I'll pause to gather any questions, also let Michael comment, is interview it for, you, for it in hiring. And we have some suggestions um, for how to do that. But very rarely do investment teams hire for curiosity. They hire for lots of other things, but they rarely ask questions about curiosity. Michael, do you have any comments? Yeah, first of all, Jason, thank you for bringing up psychological safety. This is a pet peeve of mine. Uh, you saw me move my hand to my heart 
Uh, there is no more important topic for investment teams. Curiosity is the superpower. If you don't have psychological safety, that's kryptonite to curiosity on a team, not to a person, but on a team. And what I mean by that is, as Jason said, appreciate reward questions. Do not shame mistakes. Encourage risks. Inper encourage different points of view. Don't say, well, that's silly. Psychological safety is so important. I actually co-authored a paper on it with the uh, nice folks at the Brandis Institute uh, within the last year. So if you want a copy of that, I can send you a PDF or tell you how to get it. Folks, psychological safety is critical. And with the benefit of diversity that the industry is finally starting to embrace, understand one thing. As you make your team more diverse, psychological safety is tougher to execute. Not less important, but a little tougher to execute because people are different. Folks, we need to push on psychological safety. The other thing I covered really quickly earlier about the, uh, how curious, curiosity affects a couple of the uh, investment processes. Postmortems. If you can't be curious about what we could have known at the time versus what we didn't, what any member of the team could have said differently in an investment meeting, if you can't bring curiosity to postmortems, they don't work. And postmortems are probably the single greatest learning tool that an investment team can embrace. And Jason and I have methods for how to teach how to do this well with a team. And, and selling, selling, oh, my favorite, my favorite faux pas uh, for the selling people. Well, when our thesis is broken, we sell the stock. To which Jason and I love to ask, how do you know if your thesis is broken? well, the stock is misbehaving. Well, yeah, but your thesis might be wrong in the first place. Can you get curious? People are not curious about this. So let's go to questions or comments. I see a couple things have appeared in the chat box. Yes, Jonathan said he often asks uh, himself, what's the worst thing that could happen, which is a great way of evaluating and tapping into that frontier space and getting comfort. I, I, I love that, Jonathan. I, yeah, Jonathan, though, I want to just give you, if I might, a slight edit to that, um, because that can get you overly negative too often. How about more simply, what might go wrong? Or what's the best thing that could happen? Yeah, what I might go right? But Jason and I recently worked with an investor who has a personality profile, because yes, we profiled, has a personality profile that he is preternaturally what might go wrong, but he was the leader of a team. And this really wore down the team. And so we're sitting there one day, I said, listen, just flip it. What might go right? It's still open-ended. And it was like an epiphany for him. Just flip it. Jonathan, thank you for your question. Yeah, uh, Jason thing. shared my email, email me. I will share you the link to that paper. Yeah, and Michael, that same engagement, uh, I, I had the benefit of sitting in on a pitch from one of the analyst, the research analysts uh, on the team to that same PM, and the almost the entire hour was spent examining what could go wrong. And I, like Michael, I asked same same PM, I said, you know, we've spent absolutely all this time on the risks and what could go wrong, but there's also opportunity. Otherwise, there's no reason to invest, right? If, if all we're doing is focusing on risk, we're really talking about bond investing uh, more so than anything else. <laughs> and so uh, what could go right with this? There has to be some sort of opportunity there for it to grow. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be having the conversation. And they, they just weren't used to that conversation. One of the most humorous dialogues I've ever gotten into with an investment team. I, again, Jason and I go live with investment teams. We embed with them to talk about decision-making and, and processes. I've worked with bond and stock and timber and everything pretty much. Anyway, I'm with, bond, with a bond team once and I'm sitting there and I'm trying to get them going because they were a little bit reserved. I said, all right, folks, can, can, can we just start by having an admittance all you folks want to do is get your money back. 
Can we just start there? And then, oh, did that light up the room? <laughs> and, we, and we ended up having a lot of fun in a very productive session at that point. But Jason's comment about bonds, I wanted to go there a little further. Yeah, for equity investors, people, it's what can go right. Bond investors, what can go wrong? Listen, it's both for everybody. I just want to bring in the biases that are in the different asset classes. So final comment on this, uh, and then we're going to uh, transition into the housekeeping stuff, but we have important stuff there. So don't, don't drop off yet, even though it sounds like we're wrapping up. Uh, we have important information there and a very important question to, to ask of each of you. Um, the, the last bit, we said we have ways of hiring for it. Um, one of the techniques I used to use is from our question that we asked of you earlier. I used to ask research analyst hires uh, who you know, wanted to be a part of my team, I used to ask them that very question we asked you, how many different news sources do you read? What happens when you encounter something new? And rather than just saying, are you curious? Uh, because the correct answer there is yes, and they're clearly going to answer yes. You need to look for evidence of it and ask questions about what would be evidentiary and point back towards uh, curiosity being present in that person. And uh, so it definitely factored in my hiring. And I would like to say it was one of the three sort of killer questions that really differentiated candidates who worked for me. Um, if they were curious, I, I knew that they were going to be a higher performer. Michael, you look like you were going to say something. I just found the link to send to everybody on that paper. Dun, dun, dun. Ah, you folks don't even have to send me an email, although I like emails, but you don't have to. All right, so I, I mentioned a, an important polling question. We received some feedback last time that people did not like our backgrounds. I will show you the first background that we used last time. And our question is, which do you prefer? Oh, actually, Jason, stay on yours. Let me take let me go to the former background, which doesn't Perfect. make me look like a ghost, and then they can see them side by side. There you go. So the question, I'm going to launch the question. And then the third option here is the first is this is Sherlock Holmes living room. We, That's mine. We, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which both Michael and I love and probably prefer to the one I'm using today, the gray one. But don't let don't that Don't bias the vote. <laughs> yeah, bad, bad on my part. And then the third choice would be au naturel, no background. Um, Which is what you saw with me before. Those are my bookshelves. That is my home office. And for me, that would be a view of the lake out, out behind my house, which I have been told is distracting. That looks like Jonathan's. Jonathan's background, background is very distracting. All right. So here we go. Here's the question. Which do you prefer, Sherlock Holmes, the gray one, or no background, au naturel? And that does not mean that we will be shirtless. That just means no, no formal. Yeah, background. but pants are optional, right? Hey. <laughs> well, look at that. The votes came in on that rapidly. Yeah, and strong. No background, oh, natural. Okay, I think that has it. All right, uh, we have very, Sherlock Holmes was definitely the least popular. So good that we asked this question. The gray one, also not popular. No background, good. In mine, they can't even see what my real background is. So that's definitely a photo. Well, I'm going back. I'm going to go back. They want, they want au naturel, so I will give that to them. I give would the do people that, what they want. I will do it next time. I have a screen that makes the background render better. Okay, so this brings us to the bottom of the hour. The first thing to mention is uh, Michael's birthday is tomorrow. Happy birthday, Michael. You probably didn't, you. didn't want me to mention that. Uh, our next show is going to be the 23rd of July. We're trying to establish a rhythm to these. Every other Thursday, which we've honored today, first one was two, two Thursdays ago, but we're always going to do it at noon Eastern time in the U.S. Um, so the next one is 23rd of July, where we're going to discuss portfolio construction. Uh, both Michael and I have a lot to say in that space. Also features in our embedding work. That was based on the vote from episode one, where many people indicated that's what they wanted. Then the next show is going to be the 6th of August, also Thursday, also noon Eastern. And we're going to be discussing one of my pet subject interests. And I would argue I'm one of the few experts in the world on the subject. In fact, I don't know of any others. Uh, and that's about management interviewing techniques. Uh, there's a lot of science behind that. And it comes from my over 10 years of research in this subject matter. So be sure to see that. 
And then last, uh, these recordings are on our YouTube channel from the research chair. We've had many more views of the uh, episode one on YouTube than were live last time. I anticipate that will be the case for this show as well. So from the research chair on YouTube is where you can catch the replay. Thanks so much for joining us today, everybody. Folks, it's been a pleasure. I hope you learned something. Be curious. As I like to say, always be curious, my friends. Oh, and we were encouraged to always close. We are citizens first and financial professionals second. That, that goes without saying. That's part of it, our, us honoring our curiosity. Cheers, everyone.